Good afternoon, viewers, and welcome to Matters of Public Importance, right here on Channel 6. I'm Gail Teixeira, Opposition Chief Whip in the Parliament, representing the People's Progressive Party Civic, Members of Parliament, and the People's Progressive Party. On this program, we shall focus on matters of public importance, bring you information and discussions on issues and matters that are of concern to you, the Guyanese, every Thursday between 12.30 and 1.30, right here on Channel 6. Before we go into the meat of the program, let me remind you of the telephone numbers you can use to call in when we uh, start taking calls, which will be around 1 o'clock. Um, so the numbers are 225-0010 and 225-008. So let me repeat, 225-0010 and 225-0008. And as I always remind you every week that we have the, uh, the Office of the Leader of the Opposition Office is open, 304 Church Street between New Garden and um, Peter Rose Streets in Queenstown. And we have MPs there every day between Monday and Friday. And so you're quite welcome to pop in. We're open from 9 to about 5, 5.30. And uh, we also have, we're very happy that former Prime Minister Sam Hines and former head of the Presidential Service also pop in and work voluntarily there as well. So please feel free to come. On Saturdays we're open and we try to have one of the uh, legal persons there who is a, a member of Parliament to help persons who may come with uh, advice or seeking advice to do with legal matters. And so please feel free to come. We're open to everybody, whether you voted for us or, or not, whether you like us or not, it's okay. We're here to serve the people. And so that number, if you wish to call to make appointments or just to pop in, 225-3432, 225-3432. The last two digits, we have 32 MPs. The last two digits are 32. Last week, I had informed you too that Freedom Radio has an anti-discrimination committee and this is established a uh, hotline that person can call in to report if they feel they're being discriminated against or if they are being discriminated against or they know of anybody being discriminated against they can call in to get advice what to do and where to go the telephone number is 2251479 so please feel free to call in and call in on our hotline last week i exposed uh, 15 scandalous scandalous scandals and scams <laughs> within the 15 months of the APNU AFC coalition government. That's an average of a little over one per month because they've been 15 months in, in, well, that's one per month actually. But in August alone, there's been three scandals, the drug bomb, the Hagbash BK International Settlement of $1.17 billion dollars and the third one is the Ministry of Agriculture admitting in the House that they didn't go to follow the procurement rules. They just did not do any tendering of any kind and just picked up who was around. So, scandals, scandals, and scams. Well, this program, and the number's getting higher as each day goes by. There's some others brewing, as you know. And the fourth one in, in August, which I forgot to mention, is that there are four in August. The fourth one was the fuel licenses, with no other than the GWI head and the HR manager, who they've just fired, and another chap uh, setting up a company and um, being contracted to sell fuel to GWI. Well, well, well. More and more is in the mortar, as they say. This program, however, will continue to focus on the lack of disclosure, lack of consultation, lack of transparency, and lack of accountability. And today the focus will be on local government and the working people. Well, before I show you who our guests are, we have uh, just found out yesterday, the official gazette um, posted August the 20th um, bylaws to the Municipal and District Council Act, uh, within which the Linden Town Council will be setting up tolls, toll gates, toll stations, uh, in the Linden Township, where they'll be charging fees, of course, and this is supposed to be for road use and revenue generation of the Linden Town Council. So we're not talking about the toll that you paid across the Demara Bridge in Linden, those of you who know Linden, because that bridge is not owned by the Town Council, it's owned by Nissel. However, when you read the order, it's very interesting because it doesn't say when 
this will now be put into effect. When will it start? Nor does it say where are the toll gates going to be. Now, Linden uh, boundaries, as far as I can remember, started Moblisa on the Suznak Highway and then cross over onto the other side of the Demara River. So they talk about toll gates, toll stations. So it looks as if there's going to be more than one. And then the schedule has the fees. And so these are all cars, vehicles, timber trucks, anything carrying goods and goods through Linden or to Linden will have to pay anything from a car with goods for $2,000 to haulers with machines, $7,000. And then you have the mini buses with goods for sale, 2,800, small canters with goods for sales, uh, 3,000, and then the large canters with goods for sales, $4,000, and so forth. So this has come as an absolute shock to the Linden town, Lindeners. Um, apparently, according to the Gazette, the town council made this order on July the 22nd, 2016. The order in the Gazette is um, on the 20th of August, and it was approved by the Minister of Communities on August the 18th. Now, not a word, not a word. The Lindeners didn't know this until one of the media houses, the internet media houses, leaked it yesterday. A decision of a town council in Linden makes a decision, has no consultation with the people, with the people who deliver food and other goods to Linden, and no public disclosure by the minister to say that he's approved these fees. And so Lindeners have woke up to a shock because obviously one of the immediate repercussions of this will be that the cost of goods going into Linden, I know that there are certain companies that take bread into Linden every day, the prices will go up for the people because one of the bread companies will probably have to pay maybe about four or $5,000 per truck going into Linden. If they're going on further beyond Linden, of course, that will jack up the prices for the other residents. However, also, the Lindeners themselves who are fetching goods to and from Linden are not exempt. And they have to, um, once they're living in Linden, and they can show they're a resident of Linden, and I guess they have to show it by some means, that the vehicles they use to haul goods to or from Linden, they will also be paying the fees, but they will pay it twice a year, January and July. And also, even government vehicles going into Linden, carrying goods, um, and transporting essential supplies for the government. Uh, I guess this is like drugs and, and maybe fuel and other things for government activities. Um, they have to have an approval of the RDC saying that this vehicle is legitimately doing business for the government in Linden. So this is a major headache that's come along. And obviously the big question too is, outside of lack of consultation with the people of Linden and the people who traverse through Linden, this is also another big question that has to be asked, and we're all researching it as of yesterday when we heard about this, was that can a city council bring taxes in without parliamentary approval? Because this is a tax, not the rates and taxes which councils are allowed to, to uh, uh, garner on the residents of their communities, but can a town council, any town council, any neighborhood council, levy a new tax without it going into the parliament for approval? After all, the government has to go to parliament to get a tax approved. So why would it be? It'd be rather logical if a local government can do that without approval of parliament. So that's going to be a big debate taking place. But you know, the Minister of Local Government, too, uh, local government, that is, communities, has said nothing about the parking meters in Georgetown either. Um, but I assume probably along the line he has also um, uh, given his approval. Who knows? So nobody said anything. The ministry didn't announce this. The town council didn't announce it. This is what we call lack of disclosure, lack of transparency, and lack of accountability. And I've had several calls from yesterday from people living in Linden screaming their heads off that they voted for APNU and AFC and this is what they're doing to them. And the times are really hard as hasn't been for a long, long time in Linden. So I've given them my solidarity and support and said, right on, keep on fighting. Well, I have with me today, I have with me today, today Georgetown City Councilor for the PPC, Mr. Bishram Kapin. He's, I see he's been writing lots of letters and he seems to be featuring in the news. And you know, he's one of two PBPC councillors in 
a majority dominated 90 odd percent APNU AFC Council. So we're very happy that he's been able to find time to be with us. And I have Member of Parliament, my colleague, Gillian Burton Persaud, who is a sectoral person for tourism and labor. And so we have a number of announcements today, and uh, also coming from Georgetown and Linden, to do with workers and salaries and so forth. So we're going to have a busy day today. So welcome both of you to my program and to the PP program, that is of public importance. As I said last week, I listed a number of scandalous scandals and scams. And, you know, several of them emanate from the city council, which I don't enforce and APNU controls city council from the government. Because after all, the ministers of government have to, can, and even the president can put a, a stop on some of the things happening. So, Mr. Cuppin, I know you've been trying to get the city council to have an audit, and they've been blocking you from even bringing the motion in the city council. I would like to ask you to tell us what's going on in the city council. And, you know, as, you, as I say, you're the sitting in the heart of the beast, as they say, and an undemocratic beast. Um, tell us what's going on. The public ones, parking meters, audits. We've been hearing about the movement of the vendors. And I have several calls that come in here on this program from the market vendors, from Starbuck uh, Market, uh, raising their concerns. So you have a lot to talk about with us. So bring us up to date on the latest happenings and things that are worrying you as a PVP city councillor. Thank you, Mr. Shearer. Uh, thank you for having me in your program. A good afternoon to <coughs> the listeners, the viewers, and to the good people of Georgetown. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to you, too. My fellow colleague. Um, I am one of the councillors, the PPP councillors in the city council, and I am there uh, to ensure that we have accountability, transparency, and good governance in the city. And from the get-go, one of the main things that I had um, recommended was for the city to have a forensic audit. And I had written about this, yeah. and I had spoken about this also. Um, on the matter of the audit, we were surprised the, the statutory meeting this Monday when the mayor said it was accidentally disclosed that an audit is currently going on at the city. So I'm not sure if this is an audit by the Auditor General, whether it's an internal audit, uh, whether it's an audit by an independent uh, accountant or accounting firm, uh, but she did say that an audit was ongoing. At the same time, we were notified that the city treasurer had proceeded on a vacation, but I'm not sure if it's related to the audit or whether that was um, scheduled prior to that announcement. But uh, my main contention was that once a new council came in, uh, it should have been presented with an audited financial statement so we know the disposition of the, the, exactly. the facts there, the, where the assets are, the liabilities, any contracts that were still pending uh, to be executed. And um, while we had a good orientation, I would say, the councillors, those items were not actually covered in detail. And at each of the council meetings, I kept pressing for detailed financial statements because the ones that were presented were not detailed enough. They included a lot of information about um, monies collected from the markets and from the various departments, but there was no detailed uh, explanation for the expenditures. And for me, expenditures is very important. You want to know where that money is going. Yeah. It's, it's not anybody's private money. It's not anybody's personal money. It's the taxpayers' money of sure. the city. So I was very worried about that, and I kept uh, pushing for two motions. Now, we were informed initially for anything to get to be discussed or to be discussed at the council meeting, the statutory meeting, it had to be in the agenda. And for it to be in the agenda, you had to write the town clerk and the mayor to get it on there, and I, I did that three times. <laughs> and each time, um, the town clerk found uh, some deficiency, which he did not quite explain what they were. Uh, but it wasn't only for forensic audit motion. The second one was regarding detailed financial statements for yeah. all the expenditures. Right. Because I'm interested in seeing uh, where the money is being spent. The statement simply alluded to a percentage of money being uh, spent for wages and salaries. <laughs> and you on your own had to figure out what that amount was until the last statement when they made a, an improvement a slight improvement did, but there's still no detailed expenditures. Uh, in the last statement we received, they talked about employment costs, employment overhead, and a few other areas, which are actually linked to uh, certain accounts which are not actually mentioned in the financial report. 
Now on Monday, we had a <laughs> we had an interesting session at the um, the statutory meeting. The meeting actually finished uh, sometime after nine o'clock at night, and uh, most of it took up uh, the press conference I'd held from the PPP, which stated that there were four hidden accounts. Oh. Now. The press conference I gave, that was only part of it, but they seized on that, and um, they were lambasting me for, for claiming that their, their um, hidden accounts, uh, secret accounts, and um, they went on. The, the town clerk presented his side of the story and that they have no secret accounts, and um, the mayor went on, too, that we can't make such statements, that there are no secret accounts, and so forth. Now, I had previously written the town clerk, uh, because he had threatened legal action, and I'm not afraid of any legal action that he, mm -hmm. he wants to bring forward. But he had sent a letter requesting for me to explain about these secret accounts, and I did respond to him. Mm -hmm. And what I responded, in essence, was that none of the financial statements, and I showed the, the rest of the counselors there, that they have to show me where in these statements any of those accounts were mentioned, and none of those accounts are named. The balances of those accounts right. are not there. They're not even mentioned in the reconciliation of the main account. Mm. So I explained that to them, and I said the fact that it's not being presented uh, could be interpreted as being hidden. Yeah. Now, the second point is that I did not know the names of those accounts. On a um, research on the Internet, I found a statement alluded to the town clerk where he said that the, the counselor is referring to these four accounts, and then he called out the accounts uh, some are salary, but not specifically. Later in that same interview, the city treasurer for the first time, mm -hmm. I think that was on August 10th, named four accounts. Right. Now, at the very meeting on Monday, I understand there's a fifth account uh, <laughs> that the mayor disclosed about, um, that it has been there before. But uh, my position is that for a city of this size, uh, again, it's not anybody's personal business, it's the city's business, you have to disclose these accounts on a financial statement. Right. How else are we going to be able to um, figure out where the monies are going to, where they're coming from, and so forth? Exactly. Um, so the audit is definitely needed because um, I think it will reset the monitoring mechanisms, the, um, or it will help, it will make suggestions on areas that we can improve there and ensure that we get a proper financial statement. Okay. Because I think for a city the size of Georgetown, we do need an accountant, and I'm not sure if the person responsible right now is actually certified accountant. But if that person is not, then the city ought to look into getting someone there who is um, competent to present a proper financial report to counselors. Yeah. Well, you know, they, what has shocked everybody was, I think, that um, the enormous expenditure of funds in the City Council prior to March and then even leading up to Jubilee um, and then the announcement that they were broke, that the Council was broke, had no money and yet at the same time there have been many questions, even people calling in on this program as, and we have other information about certain companies getting the programs to clean up and even I remember uh, standing on Church Street watching a guy um, cut the grass on the, what's it called, Presidential Mall mm -hmm. or whatever mm -hmm. it's called. And it was all sand, but he was cutting with the grass hut cutter with his uniform and stuff like that. So that it just seemed to be an absolute waste of money that was going on. Um, so, I mean, the public is concerned about that. Now Jubilee's over. Mm -hmm. The trenches are all <laughs> uh, <laughs> filling up. And, and, and in some areas, obviously, they concentrated a lot on the center of the city but areas outside of the center of the city were, were not treated. So what's going on with those issues? And then, of course, I want you to bring the viewers up to date with what is the status of Starbuck Market? And, of course, Kitty Market is another issue we need to talk about um, because I understand it's about $200 million for that building and, and so on. So we'll get to that when we get to that. But, so I don't want to curtail you because you may have issues you want to raise yourself. Yeah. So please feel free to raise what you think are issues and to add on these are the issues that are ongoing. Okay, going back to the same expenditure, um, I don't think they have figured out uh, or they understand priorities or how projects should be approached within the city. Because to me, um, I don't disagree completely with the these Merriman Mall projects, but I think this is not the time for those projects, especially when you're short on cash. Uh, the things that are affecting the city right now, it's the uh, drainage, it's security uh, for people within the city. 
It's the markets and the, the overflow vendors and all the pavements and so forth. And those should be addressed first in a traffic situation. Now this project, they have started many projects and they are stalled simply because I think it's a misallocation of resources. So uh, they can go on because they've run out of money. And the fact that they are not bringing this uh, fully to the council, uh, the council is not getting an opportunity to then direct where, um, where they should spend money. I should say that the, in requesting for this information to be brought to the full council, um, I was told uh, that this information is available through the Finance Committee. But these committees are only supposed to make recommendations, not they final decisions. They have to decisions. report to the Council. Yes. And they have to report to the full Council. But as of yet, we have not seen anything substantive coming from, from the Finance Committee in particular. <laughs> um, and that's, that we will promise the, the report. That's the heart of everything. Yes. <laughs> or the brain. One of the and two. Uh, I don't see the reason why a councillor should go to the finance uh, <coughs> meeting. I mean, it might be important from time to time to go there. But all the recommendations made within those committees should come to the full council. But there are monies and projects being undertaken um, that is not coming to the full council. So we don't even know, for instance, how much money has been spent in the Merriman Mall. Yeah. How much money has been spent on the actual cleanup for the um, Starbrook area or the relocation of the vendors? Uh, we really don't have any ideas other than, um, as stated, the employment overhead that they keep referring to and a few other areas. There's no detailed information there. So uh, they cannot proceed right now because I think it's mismanagement of the resources of the city. So important projects like cleaning the drains, uh, removing trash and so forth, is causing a major problem right now. But what is happening with the two companies that they owe all this money for garbage collection? Because the companies, I understand, are threatening to go on strike. Yeah, they are they, threatening they to go on strike. Is it hundreds of millions of dollars? Yeah, is that are, so? Yes, hundreds of millions, I think. Um, uh, Jillian, if you feel, yeah. feel free to jump in, please. Yeah. Go ahead, Kapit. Yeah, um, um, Savans is owed a hundred and something million. I think BK is owed, um, um, Purans is owed 70 million. Um, uh, one of the issues I had brought up when we were looking through these uh, financial statements was the fact that they were paying five million, five point something million per month for a road sweeper. Now I have experience living abroad for a very long time and I know road sweepers are only effective sweeping the curb because that's where all the debris end up, at the curbs. But in the city of Georgetown, vehicles park on both sides and we don't have any traffic laws that say on Wednesdays no one parks in a particular that's site. Right. So. I recommended that the council for that service to be discontinued and save 60 million or so each year. Because in a four week month, it's about 5 million. On a five week month, it's 6 million. Mm. Um, and there were some other councillors that uh, jumped in from different perspective. Now we were um, pleasantly informed that they have discontinued that service. Mm. Additionally, um, because they can't pay Savans and Purans, now the city um, solid waste department is taking over the pick, uh, picking up garbage in certain areas to assist in that areas. Now as far as where uh, the contractors are going legally, I'm not sure. But I think the city itself need to look within uh, to see if they can uh, stop uh, contracting most of this work out, whether it's uh, the solid waste management or the security services and, and start bringing it in-house so you save on money. Well, I mean, I've, I've lived in the city, and I think you have too, when the city council was in charge of the garbage collection, and it wasn't any great shakes. Um, in fact, one of the predictable things is that with the contracted companies, that, you know, that they do come as planned mm -hmm. at a particular date. Um, but the problem, they're twofold. One is, is there a better solution? Obviously, the council, yourself, and others. But... Um, one is the quality of service, and two, if the city council has a contract with people, then he must honor it. Because it also, we are well aware that during the cleanup campaign, companies were given contracts without going to tender whatsoever. So, and some of those companies, I understand, at least with the Durban Park, where that is more uh, Ministry of the Ministry of Presidency and the Ministry of Public Infrastructure that they owe hundreds of millions of dollars to some of those same contractors who got work with the Georgetown City Council. So um, we, we also have to ensure that we are honoring what we owe. Oh, I agree, I and, agree with you. You know, they, these are companies that also hire workers. Yes. They well, hire hundreds of workers. Yes, but that is very <laughs> why I wanted to touch on, um, Gail, because the fact that when I read about the 
two companies being owed a large sums and having to take industrial actions. Yeah. Now, what it said there immediately that if they cannot receive their payments yeah. for the services rendered, then persons are going to go on the bread line. Exactly. Because they will have to shed persons. Also, looking at the fact of um, the vendors and uh, reallocation, you know, reallocation of these vendors, how do we go about to doing it? Do we sit and have consultation with the vendors and the counselors and come up with the best possible alternatives or are we just going to hustle into a program to let it look like we're doing something as what happened with the Parliament View Mall? They're being placed there. They're not getting any particular sales. The, the, the situation there and um, Councillor Coupin and myself, we accompanied the leader of the opposition um, earlier this year when we went through a few months ago to check on what was happening there, right. deplorable conditions, right. and also the fact that it is a temporary arrangement. So persons cannot have a long-term plan for their businesses or themselves. They are now placed in a position where they can wake up tomorrow morning and realize that they have to be removed from there to go where. And the breaking up of the stalls, you know, yeah. the demolition of the stalls of vendors without them knowing. All of these are industrial relation actions and um, their issues and they will affect the people, their workers in the non-traditional sector. And uh, what we saw um, this week is the emergence of a union called the, vendor, the Vendors Union. Now I'm wondering if they are, if it's a legitimate organization. This is particularly to a market or to, generally? Well, the it's the vendor, so apparently it's general to the vendor. Okay, so it's so not particular to a particular market. They yeah. need to know whether or not, how do persons join, what are the, you know, the, the situation with that, because we do not want situations where persons just come together, form these organizations, and when they would have achieved maybe their goal, or, or whatever might have been their personal um, agenda, then the vendors are once again left in a position. So these are some of the industrial relations issues as it pertains to the council. Right. Uh, if I may add, the, yes, we, we were notified of this union being formed, and I understand it's a former councillor from, yeah. from that formed this union, and there was a fee of $2,000 to join and $1,000 monthly. Now, I'm not sure about the membership, how many people mm. have signed up for this member uh, membership. But is it a registered organization? organization? Has it been registered? I am not sure whether it's just received a business registration or it's actually duly constituted. So before the city... Because registered under the Friendly Society Act. Yes, yeah. that's right. Um, the, the council, at the council meeting had expressed some reservations and they would have to look into this. So I don't think they're, they're actually accepting the council is being a bargaining agent as yet right. for the um, the vendors. Now, in the relocation of the vendors, um, what was initially discussed at the meeting is that uh, they were speaking about cleaning up Starbuck Market. Right. And it was decided that that area was be going to be cleaned up. It was not discussed that it was going to be, be a, a permanent sale. relocation. No, that they were going to move there. And uh, I think. Um, the move that they made initially to move the vendors was a wrong one because yeah. you can't move uh, the vendors unless you had a permanent place for them. Exactly. And they had not even secured the agreement yet mm. for the. Yeah, and when the they agreement. told them to move, and they started breaking the down. Mall, yeah. View mall, and these people, these people are struggling. These, you know, on that particular day that they sell, that is perhaps what they're gonna buy right. food for their family and so forth. So I thought it was handled very badly, and um, we do need to come up with a solution for the vendors. Um, they removed them from there, but I think it was, like I said, premature. They vanished to remain there until a permanent solution was found. Now, they said they were moving the vendors because it would present a bad image for the people who came to the 50th anniversary celebration. Right. <laughs> In fact, I, I think that the place looked much worse after the... Yeah, they, that side piece there is... Yeah, they, mm -hmm. they pulled out all the, um, the traffic lanes that they had there, mm -hmm. those yellow things, and there were pockets, holes all over the road. So. I didn't think it do, uh, did any good for the city. Uh, the vendors, um, currently we are tasked with, um, I'm on the markets committee, I'm on three committees within the council. One is our markets and public health. They have been tasked with coming up with a policy statement. Mm. And that policy would govern vending across the entire city. Mm -hmm. uh, the initial stage of that uh, is to visit all the markets. We have already visited um, 
uh, the Starbuck market. Uh, We've gone to the Merriman Mall area. Today, this, um, I should join them after this meeting. They're visiting um, Le Penitent's market. So mm. once we have visited all the markets, then the committee will come up with a policy statement, and then they'll get uh, input from um, NGOs and so forth to come up with this document. But I think in the meantime, uh, the vendors are not making any sales over there, and the council need to move very quickly to put them in a position where they're able to that being said, it should be acknowledged that overall, businesses slow down tremendously. Yeah, exactly. And um, so there are a lot of things that tie into this, not only for these additional fees that they are planning to put up with containers and so forth. I think the cumulative effect of that is uh, one of a uh, difficult time for people to meet their payrolls, their bills, and so forth mm -hmm. in the city. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the market vendors, and the problem with the vendors generally is that the majority are female. Yes. Yeah. And so these many are, and, and many are single parents with children who are making an honest living. They're not dishonest people. They're not in criminals. They're, they're struggling to keep their children alive and children going to school and having opportunities. So this ruse, I, I believe that what was pulled on the market vendors in Stabrook was a ruse, was a hoax. Mm -hmm. They were told they were going to be temporarily moved and it, they were given the impression this is just for Jubilee. When they moved, then you had the announcement by the number one person in the country saying that you're going back there. After yeah. three months up, you're not going back there. So then city council then uh, has whatever arrangement they have with the person who owns the land they're on. But that cannot be a permanent arrangement. When you look at border, border mall, the mall part I'm talking about, uh, where they put up these stalls, and by the way, people call them stables because they look like horse stables. But there's hardly any activity there at all uh, because a lot of the vendors aren't there. They, 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 they. Then you go to the next part, which was the basketball court, and now you have a string of new new stalls there that were never there before. Hairdressers. Yeah. Hairdressers. Why do I want hair and nails and everything around where food is? Yeah, they, That's another issue. But the, that, that border area, the first part, which is um, the, the mall part, there was lots of active, lots of stores. Half of them are empty and people hardly going there. Then, of course, Kitty, they, they moved the vendors so they could fix the building. I've never seen, an, and I'm not an expert on engineering, but I've never seen a building being built from the top bottom. <laughs> I've never seen a building you finish the top and you haven't done fixing the bottom, the, the foundation, re, uh, uh, the drainage, all these other things. So, I mean, because it, again, I think one of the things that they realized, one, that they were putting new boards on old boards. The beams were old and they yes. were replacing it with new, putting new boards on top of that. And you could have seen from standing outside of the market, the termites yeah, that yeah. were eating at those beams. And uh, also, I think, I would want to feel they just discovered and we did mention it um, when we were doing our local government campaign for Kitty, yeah. that the problem with the Kitty market is that the inside is lower than the road. Rate. Exactly. And so when it rains, the water flows from the road into the market and it becomes like a pool. Yeah. So maybe they have now discovered that and so yes, halted have, the entire situation. Yeah, yeah. Because, uh, but I think that, you know, the... the Look, in these local government elections, let's put aside Hamilton Green and all the nonsense that went under. No matter what this government says about the PPC, Georgetown City Council has been managed by GGG, PNC, and now PNC, APNU, AFC. From 19, well, from the 1980s, but let's go from 1992 to now. And therefore, you know, the sins of their fathers are on them. But the problem is that at these elections, people went on constituency basis. So 50% for constituency, 50% for the PR. What are the constituency candidates? Because you're a PR, you're a PR, right? Mm -hmm. You were a PR person. The PPP did not win one constituency in Georgetown. It was overwhelmingly for APNU AFC. One independent and two PPP councillors sit on the council now. So they're in a minority, absolute minority. Um, so what are these constituency candidates who won elections under the name of the APNU AFC doing for their communities? Mm -hmm. Are they getting up and saying, you can't do this for the representative who is responsible for Stabrook, for the representative who won in Kitty? Mm -hmm. 
We lost in Kitty, and we usually won win Kitty. The the what are they doing about the the people in Charlestown, Alboystown, who won those constituencies? What about those who won? Because when they finish with those markets, they're going further into Rheinveld and those other markets as well. Mm -hmm. What are people, what are these candidates who won under the back of the APNU AFC, what are they doing to represent their people? There, there are some, I should say that there are some councillors, uh, a few councillors who are vocal, um, but not in a way that you would expect them to be, especially when certain critical issues came up. But there are some of them that are doing work in their neighborhood, um, uh, which doesn't, I think, um, deal with some of the major issues, but they are vocal, some of them, not all. Yeah. And um, mostly when it comes down to it, they're, they're going along. They're carrying supporting. the party line. Yes. Yeah. You know. Well, you some know. Have been, some have been constructive in the statements and the proposals uh, that they're making. Yes. Uh -huh. but, but overall, I think as a council, we have not really accomplished anything of significance yet. Uh, simply because um, there are some of these underlying requirements, prerequisites that we should have had going forward. And I think most of the time when we reach at the meetings, we're talking about certain items, but let's say, for instance, items that, that are going on within the finance committee, it's not coming forward for yeah. us to, but then you're hearing announcement that the council has decided, and sometimes I ask myself, I wonder which council they're referring to, because it was not yeah. brought to the full council. But you know, it's, 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 it's rather strange that what you're experiencing in the city council is not exclusive to Georgetown City Council. Even in the seven regions we control, we're having terrible times with the ARIO. So you have your town clerk giving you, he's behaving as if he's the king of Georgetown. Um, you have a queen of Georgetown, you have a king of Georgetown. So he seems to sometimes play the role as if he's the mayor and there is no mayor. Um, but the two of them are, as they say in Guyana, Batty and Poe. But maybe there's another thing I could use. Um, however, what I'm trying to say is in the regions, the Arios uh, uh, have made it very difficult for the RDCs to get information from the Finance Committee um, of what's transpiring. And, and even in a number of other regions, they, there seems to be almost like a policy direction of lack of disclosure. In other words, you know, information is power. If you have information, you know, you have power in your hands. So that, and even in Parliament, look at the supplementary financial papers, the, the ones that exposed all the drug bond and the, mm -hmm. I think. If we don't get a chance to ask our questions, and we have to fight for space to ask our questions, we have a speaker who's constantly interrupting us sometimes and telling us don't give long explanations. And sometimes to ask a question, you need to have a little preamble to contextualize what you're saying. No, no, no. And then you have ministers making long speeches and attacking the, the PVPC, and, and the speaker does nothing. However, these question per period uh, times are absolutely critical for parliamentary democracy. And so too the governance at the city council level. Um, that, that the council has to be accountable to the people who voted for them. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, we want to call Guyana democracy, but I think there ought to be full di disclosure. If we don't have it in the laws, maybe we should have a sunshine law. All these items that are coming up must be fully disclosed. Uh, if you are not making it um, available for the public for scrutiny, then perhaps there's something that you want to hide in there. And if the, the current administration, when they were campaigning, wants to follow up with the promises that they're going to have accountability, transparency, then they ought to encourage, for instance, in the council, for all these items to be made public for scrutiny. Okay, that's the only way you'll know. Um, you have to have opposition and you have to have yeah, proponents yeah. of... of um, but you know, Article 13 ideas. of the Constitution says very clearly that we're... Uh, we are a country that, that provides for inclusive governance, number one, and parliamentary democracy, and says in Article 13 that the people of the country must be involved in the decision-making process and must have a say in decisions that affect their lives. So that's the umbrella uh, uh, constitutional article that permeates the whole society and should. But we also have Access to Information Act that says governments and these agencies, local government, must make the following information available. And that a citizen can write the Commission of Information seeking information. Now, if it is already on a website or the Gazette or whatever, he would say, 
That's an abuse of the access to information. However, you can ask for several pieces of information which are not posted and publicly available. Once it doesn't deal with someone's medical history, and you can only do that with his permission, his or her permission, you can't ask questions to do with a commercial undertaking, like a negotiating, negotiations that are going on for a, a company to do investment in Guyana, stuff like that. They're very, very limited areas, and then a security defense, border security and stuff like that. The rest of the time, the citizens have to know that this act, they can ask, and they must ask. Because, and the, I, but before I move to Gillian Moore, can the, can the public go and sit in on the city council meetings? Yes, they can go and sit in on the council meetings. And meeting. what about so the committee the, meetings? Uh, the, I'm not sure about the committee meetings, but I know about the, the statutory meetings. We have two each month, and you do have reporters that go there. Yeah. Sometimes the reporters do leave early when the meetings go beyond 4 or 5 o'clock. Yeah, so but the public can attend as yes, observers. Yes, the public can attend, yes. And can we not get the city council to advertise what days and times so the public knows, put in the newspaper, on a website, or something, or maybe you, we put it out on your Facebook or yes, something to let the public know. Yes. You know, the other thing is that with the committees, you as a councillor can sit in on any committee I can sit as in an on observer. As an observer, I can contribute, but I cannot vote on the committee. Exactly. Yes. You, yeah. Okay. Now, Gillian, and this I'm sure will be of interest to Mr. Cuppin too. Um, Sabrick News reports that a final offer for differentiated wage increases for public service ranging from 10% at the lowest scale to 1% at the highest has been made by the Guyana government and the GPSU is considering this proposal. Have you had a chance to look at that? Because yes, it only came out I this did. morning. Yes, I and did so I'm interested to knowing to what your views are. Well, my views on that is, you know, when uh, the coalition was on their campaign trail in 2015, they did promise the workers of this country that one of their 100 days plans that they would have increased the salaries uh, for public servants to 20%. Yes. yes. And that included um, specifically nurses, teachers at all levels, security personnel, and civil servants on the traditional payroll. What we saw in the 2015 budget was that uh, what was touted as a 10% increase from 20% was in actual fact a 5% increase. The very percentage of increase that they were um, walking all over the PPP government for when 5% yeah. would have been the amount offered, right. but via the way of a collective bargaining process. And retro to the beginning of the year. the beginning of the year. So you had your full 5%. What has happened in the 2016 budget, no increase was given, and when the question was asked, um, Parliament was told by the Minister of Finance that because the Committee of Inquiry did not complete their work on time to hand in the report, it could not have been included, any consideration could not have been had to be included in that budget. Now, 2017 budget is coming out, and what we have seen is that as of yesterday, the government is saying that its final offer is, well, varied amounts. Um, for those less than $99,000, it will be a 10% increase. Those between 100 to 299,000 is 6% increase. 300,000 to 499,000 is 5%. 500,000 to 799,000 is 4%, right. 800,000 to 999,000, 2%, and for a million dollars and above, 1% increase. Now, what is the reality of those figures? It means that persons who might be working and earning $98,000, their salary will go now to uh, approximately $107,000. And for those for $100,000, they will now get approximately between $106,000 and the highest figure, which is $299 to $316. So we see the levels, the higher the salary, the higher it's going up. And I Just because the baseline is the larger. The baseline, right. And I could remember um, hearing the Minister of Finance saying that um, they're against this across the board increases, they need yeah. to have levels, and they need to have... Um, demarcated um, levels for persons earning, you cannot give everybody the same increase. But in actual fact, 
what does it say? Because we have a lot of things to take into consideration with these increases. We still have to look at the NIS deductions. We still have to look at the PAYE deductions. And uh, I was looking at the fact that when the parking meters come into being, what will happen to those workers who their employers do not provide specialized or private parking spaces for them? Many of them park along the, the roadways and the sides of the roads just outside of where they work. If a parking meet is placed there, then they have to pay parking. And um, the back and forth figures, one of the last one was $200 per hour. An eight hour person has to pay $1,600 per day. It means that they will be paying $8,000 per week. And it means at the end of the month, they have to tap up a figure of $32,000. Now, when you take all of that into consideration, along with the PAYE, which is about $12,900 per month on the $98,000 salary, and then they have an NIS of about $5,000 and something dollars, add that all together, that person will be basically taking home something within the vicinity of 63 or so thousand dollars 50 something thousand dollars per month that doesn't have the wear and tear the foods and all the utility bills so work. again what we're seeing here is that the workers the public servants are being taken for a ride what they felt was going to be glory hallelujah for them after may in the may 2015 it is not in reality being that and then now, what, where does it leave the unions in all of this? The collective bargaining process is not being adhered to. It is more a case where these figures, these amounts are being shoved down the throats of the unions because they're saying that they are not um, completely com comfortable with the way in which this process is going. It's like take it or leave it and that's it. So. To my mind, what we're going to see is more and more disputes coming out from the unions. And I want to say that after May 2015, the unions are really, really at the stage where they are no longer comfortable and they have to now come out and speak out for the workers that they represent. But they do it in the sense, as I call them, the, the apologists. Yeah. That <laughs> these were the wickedness that the PP did, so the APNA AFC is following the same line. The problem is that even in 2016, the discipline forces of this country always used to get a month, used to get whatever the public service got is increased, and along with a month as salary. well as one month salary. Now, if you were a high-ranking officer in the Army of Police, you would, got, you would get your full salary. If you're a lower rank, it was your full salary. Last year, they gave them $50,000 across the board. No salary mm -hmm. increase because they... And, and in fact, this year, I believe they're not going to get a salary increase at all again. They're lucky if the discipline forces get the one month shot at Christmas, and it may be another 50000 because they said in the budget that the discipline forces, the teachers, if you'll correct mm -hmm. me if I'm wrong, um, couldn't get salary increase because they had to wait for the commission, commission inquiry. inquiry yeah. And the reason why they had to do that, because they had to wait for the look at equivalencies mm -hmm. between the public sector and the, the non-public uh, non service union members. However, the commission inquiry was never asked in the first place to, look at to make recommendations and salaries. salaries. So it could not make recommendations and salaries. So my view is that them firemen and policemen, soldiers and, and prison officers who think somewhere along the line there's going to be a salary increase, I would treat that with caution. I would treat that with caution because now they have to go back on their word about mm -hmm. equivalencies. And if in this process with the public service unions, here's a union call for 40 percent increase. increase. They came down to 25 percent increase with allowances. The government has now come up with a formulation which the union, I understand, uh, uh, will consider, except the press said that um, that the, the government and the PSU, yes, they concluded discussions on wages and salaries for public servants within the bargaining unit. So, but there's no public formal declaration, Rated is there? No, there is none. Right? And what I want to think, too, is that uh, 
I've often said that what the increases that is given to public servants, that has its bearings on what the private sector increases to its employees are. And after touting this big 20% increase for public servants, somewhere along the line, I think um, it was realized that if 20% is given to the public sector employees, then the private sector has to go a bit higher. And with all the, the, the economy on a decline and all yeah. the taxes being brought on stream and all the duties that the, the, the private sector now has to bear, it is hard for them to come on par with any substantial increase to the public servants. So I think this is where now you're having a shift in all the time. And as you rightly said, Gail, very soon there will not be increases because if the private sector cannot make the revenue, yeah. the money to pay the increases, then it comes to bear on the government to still make the process of a salary increases to the public servants. Yeah. And more for the discipline services, because they made a lot of promises, as you said, in the election campaigns. Okay. The, um, this, all, all these negotiations have a ripple effect. Local government employees, mm -hmm. for example, so municipalities, NDCs, private sector. And I saw that the Bauxite Union, they they're, they're, also they're came out with a statement saying that the APNU is not kept to their, exactly, their coalition because promises. because what they did on the campaign trail, as the, the, the Bauxite Union is saying, that they used the, the, the Roussel issue, that they were going to have it um, finished, completed, resolved. And uh, on that, the Lindeners voted because many of their persons, they were um, residents who were affected. And now that they're in government, they're not seeing any movement on it. No. And they would want to feel that the meeting called yesterday by the Minister of Social Protection is one where these heavy statements can be given to boost up the, the Congress that will commence tomorrow. And her candidacy in the um, election. The <laughs> now, what I want to say is the fact that uh, it is no surprise labor is going within that direction. The fact that uh, a ministry was reduced to the level of a department, and to date, they have not been any persons with the experience in industrial relations that have been placed to head the department, more or less the ministry. Yeah. So it's novice that you're having, not amateurs, persons who knows nothing about labor, heading the Labor Department and more so heading the, the, the ministry that governs that. Yeah, exactly. So it's no wonder that Labor is in the confusion that it's in. Yeah, I know. They, we've been very bad today, uh, viewers, and I know you'll, you'll, you'll be very mad at me because we've been running along and we didn't realize the time went so fast. It's my fault um, because some of you have been trying to get in. And so uh, there is coming one. I let one and please, for the, I have three minutes left, so be very short, please because I really feel bad about not allowing any callers in. It was not deliberate. It's my fault. Okay. Thank you. Morning. M afternoon. Matters of public importance. Welcome. Hi. Good afternoon to the public. Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Mr. Chair, I got one articulation. Two things. Yes. I want to show me two things what they do since they were in office. The only thing I see them do, they give themselves a fat salary. And the next thing was... Uh, coalition fraud and fraud the whole nation. People only waiting now, counting in the days shortly to just get them out of power. And when Mr. Shiro get back in power, you must do the right thing and listen to guy and these people and the poor people in this country. I will. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Now there's, uh, sorry, everywhere you go, people are uh, worried, insecure, uncertain, about what to do and where this country is going. And so, you know, residents of Georgetown are uh, perturbed. They don't know what to do. They don't know how to, to manage. They're fearful of these parking meters. You were telling me just before the program, I've got one minute left, to do with the derelict uh, buildings that they're going to be pulling down. I want you to just give a last comment on that. Yes, the yes. City Hall has reached a decision that uh, they're going to demolish uh, 53 buildings around the city of Georgetown. And I quickly asked them, I recommended that it be published in the paper, but uh, that recommendation was not um, accepted and I abstained from the vote, but by majority, uh, they are going to go ahead with the demolition. These are private buildings, privately private owned buildings. buildings. 
they said notices were sent to the, the individuals, but many of these people might be living overseas or out of the area. Yeah. But, and some also have people living in them. So they'll coordinate with the relevant agencies to deal with relocation. But the ones that are unoccupied, they're going to demolish, begin the But who's going to pay for the demolition? Uh, they were saying that the cost will be uh, put to the property owner. But if you can't find the property owner? Uh, <laughs> you, you, have, you have an additional burden on the city uh, exactly. to collect that. So. Yeah, again, these are decisions. I will talk more about this on another program because I'm sure that um, greater efforts and their legal issues to do with dem demolishing property uh, private property in particular. The City Council has a lot of work to do and cannot behave like the guys at the top who just make announcement it must happen. By the way, Walter Roth Museum, I hear that Dr. Rupert Rupnarine said that he has asked Mr. President to put on hold the removal of Walter Roth Museum and my interpretation of that is that he's going to ask President Granger. I'm prepared as a citizen candidate to wait and see. However, we have the petition, Save the Walter Roth Museum, on the website, change.org. Please join us. We have over 500 signatures. And just in case, just in case, as we saw with the Stabrick Market vendors, they were moved temporarily, and now it has become a permanent fact. Um, we don't want Walter Roth to be moved. It is, uh, would mean a front to our first people of our country and a great risk to very, very precious and priceless artifacts that go back 7,000 years. So we've had an interesting program. Thank you, Mr. Kapin. I'm so Thank glad you, you came Thank on the program. I've been trying to get you for a while, so I'm very glad to have you. <laughs> and Gillian, I think this is your second or third yeah. time round. It's always wonderful to have you on my program. Thank you very much, and Thank we look forward to, to having you again. And please feel free, Mr. Kapin, if there are issues happening in the city council that you think the public needs to know about, you can tell me. You can come on or I can do it whichever one is better so everyone here thank you very much uh, I hope you've enjoyed matters of public importance um, we will see you next week Thursday uh, 1230 as usual have a blessed week and always remember what I tell you each time at the end of each program don't drink and drive we want to have our people alive and healthy we want you to be with your families who love you and you love them so please be careful if you're gonna drink and you're not you shouldn't drive, get a taxi, get a minibus, ask a friend who knows how to drive to drive your car home, park your car, whatever it is, please, please, too many road fatalities, too many people are dying on the road, most of it from speeding and from drinking and driving. So have a blessed week, and we'll see you again next Thursday on Matters of Public Importance. All the best to you. Bye-bye. Ta-ta. Bye. -bye. Bye.